Well, there's a lot there in the prodigal son, in the story of the prodigal son. But where I'd like to focus today, Kirk, where I'd like to focus today is on our reading from the epistles from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. So if you turn there, and I really want to focus on just two verses this afternoon, uh, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Now, the other passages that we read this morning, they all had the common theme, as I mentioned earlier, and God's, God's salvation, God's forgiveness. Uh, the reading from Isaiah 12, 1 through 6, gives us the song of those who have experienced God's salvation. In fact, in one, of the, in one of the churches I grew up in, we used to sing, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Psalm 32 gives us the prayer of one whose sins have been forgiven. And then our reading in Luke, in the Gospel, gives us a picture of the sinner's journey back to the forgiveness and mercy of his Father. And this reading where we're going to be today in 2 Corinthians 15 instructs us as how we are to regard each other as forgiven people. And that's where we want to stay this morning or this afternoon. So today's reading from now on, therefore, starts with a therefore. And we know that therefore means for this reason or because of that reason. And therefore refers to something else that we have to take a quick look at before we can move on so that we can understand what Paul is writing about here in the scriptures. So because of what or for what reason, Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. So because of what reason is that so? Because of what reason do we not regard, do we no longer regard uh, one another according to the flesh? Well, because the love of Christ compels us. Because Christ died for all. Because we are a forgiven people and therefore now live for Christ, in Christ, we regard no one according to the flesh. Put it another way. Because we are in Christ, we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be. We are new creatures. We are a new creation. Everything is new including the way we see the world, the way we see each other. Now, Paul admits that he once judged Christ according to the flesh, but he does so no longer. And for that matter, so did the other apostles, even though they were with Jesus from the beginning. When they regarded Christ according to the flesh, they saw him as the one who would restore the kingdom to Israel. Even after the resurrection, they asked him that question just before his ascension. Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom? And I can just imagine the face plant like, you guys still don't get it, do you? But Jesus is the ever patient teacher with us. When Paul regarded Christ from a worldly point of view, he saw him as the other Jews saw him, as a blasphemer, as a troublemaker, whose followers needed to be eradicated. That was Paul's mission. Remember, we meet Paul at the stoning of Stephen. He was, hey, watch my coat while we go kill this guy. Well, Paul was the guy watching the coats. And he approved, Scripture says. And he went on a, per, on a tear of persecution against the church. And we know how that ended up. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And once God revealed Christ to Paul as the Messiah and the Son of God, Paul now saw Jesus as Lord. He no longer regarded him according to the flesh. He saw him as Lord, and he also extended the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his ministry. So he no longer regarded Jesus according to the flesh, but he also no longer regarded the Gentiles according to the flesh. Because remember, Paul was a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, you would have nothing to do with Gentiles. But now he became the apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul was now a new creation, and everything he did, everything he saw, everything he said, the way he saw everything was brand new. And the same is true for us. But, you know, we, 
we like to bring our old habits with us sometimes. And that's, you know, that, that's, uh, that's just true of each of us. You know, when, when we're saved, we become a new creation, but we're not an instantaneously perfect creation. God is working through us. He's, he's sanding down those rough edges in us. He's dealing with those things that are not pleasing to him. He's dealing with the sin that still remains in our members. Remember, we are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved in the present from the power of sin. That's a lifelong process. When we get to glory, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Sin will no longer be an issue. Hallelujah. But every now and then, being the creatures that we are, we still judge each other according to the flesh every now and then, don't we? Now, either positively or negatively, we judge each other according to the flesh, according to what a person seems to be. Now, on the positive side, now, let me roll back a little bit. We, we can do it positively, and I'll explain that. We can do it negatively, and I'll explain that too. Either way is wrong. Either way is a mistake. But we have to, we have to watch out either way for what we're doing. So this is what I mean. On the positive side, when we judge people according to the flesh or according to what they seem to be, we make the mistake of looking at someone's natural traits or characteristics to fulfill a kingdom call. Get what I'm saying? We look at somebody's natural gifts and abilities. We say, oh, that'll be useful for the kingdom of God. Yeah, if only God would save that person. But we put ourselves, when we do that, on the same path to make the same mistake that the prophet Samuel made when God sent him to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king for Israel. I won't read that. You can uh, mark it down if you want. That's in 1 Samuel 16. Now, Israel was still on their first king. His name was Saul. And Saul was described in scripture as handsome. There was not a man in the people of Israel more handsome than he. And from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Saul looked like a king. He looked the part. Now Samuel knew that Saul had been rejected by God because of his disobedience. But his replacement, at the very least, would have to look the part, wouldn't he? I mean, hey, I got to go pick out a king. I got to, somebody who looks the part. I mean, we, we, we do that, you know, we do that, uh, as an aside, we do that in, in, during election time. Who looks more presidential? Who acts more presidential? You know, uh, if, well, I don't know if anybody here remembers that, because I don't. I was only three. But uh, when John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon had their debate, their presidential debate, Actually, that was 1959, 1960, so I really wasn't here. Anyway, uh, the folks who listened to the debate on the radio said that Richard Nixon won. The folks who watched it on television said that Kennedy won because of his appearance, because he looked youthful, he looked fit. Nixon had a five o'clock shadow, which made him look older. He was sweating under the TV lights, which made him look nervous. John F. Kennedy looked tan and healthy. Nobody knew at the time, but that tan wasn't really a tan. It was the color, the discoloration of his, sin, of his skin from Addison's disease. But we wouldn't learn that till later. But my point is here, when we look at someone's natural, when we see somebody's natural characteristics, we judge them according to the flesh. We can make a mistake like Samuel did. Samuel walks into Jesse's house and he sees the firstborn, Eliab. And he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. He looked at him and said, wow, this must be the guy. And God corrected him on the spot. Now, based on what Samuel could see, he was certain this guy's going to be king. There was no doubt in his mind. That's what the, that's what the word surely means. There's no doubt. This must be the guy. And God had to pull him up short and correct him. He spoke to him and said, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God's chosen king was still out in the field watching the sheep. 
He was the smallest, it says. He was the youngest. He didn't even warrant consideration by his own father when the prophet came and said, bring your sons before me. Eh, David, you don't count. He can stay out there in the fields. But that was God's choice. Had this election been left to Samuel, he would have picked another Saul. Because Jesse's oldest matched the description as Saul. He was handsome. He was tall. He looked like a king. If we follow Eliab's story into 1 Samuel 17, he was among the ranks of Israel who ran when Goliath came out to challenge the armies. He was with Saul on the front lines. And when Goliath came out, they all ran like little cowards. And Eliab was there. But David, David showed up and said, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Eliab didn't have the courage to stand up to Goliath, but he managed to muster enough courage to chew out his little brother. Why are you here? You just want to see the battle. David didn't regard Goliath according to the flesh. Goliath was over seven feet tall. Picture Shaq O'Neal in armor, and you've got Goliath. But David didn't regard Goliath according to the flesh. He saw him for what he was, an uncircumcised enemy who had brought reproach to Israel and defied the armies of the living God. He needed to be dealt with, and David was more than willing. You know, as an example, look at the high-profile people in the Christian world, such as Brian Houston. He's the pastor of Hillsong Global. It's a big mega church out of Australia. They have campuses around the world, including New York. For that matter, I could, ma I could mention uh, the pastor of that church, Carl Lenz. Both of them brought down by sexual scandal. We could look at Robbie Zacharias, brilliant apologist. We have to be careful because even in the Christian world, we can regard folks like that according to the flesh because we can be taken by their charisma by their brilliance, by their leadership skills, by their ability to build large ministries. I think of uh, Bill Hybels out in uh, Willow Creek Church in uh, Illinois. Every year they used to have this leadership summit. Thousands of people around the world would come in directly or watch remotely to see top CEOs from companies around the world talk about leadership. But these are people who were invited because we regard them according to the flesh for their skills. And when we look through the, that kind of a lens, we create blind spots for ourselves. Because we don't see problem areas such as behavior. Nobody thought it was a problem when Rabbi Zacharias went on the road by himself without his wife. What church would do that, really? Send the pastor out on the road for weeks at a time without his wife. So we can develop blind spots when we look at each other according to the flesh. Like I said, behavior is one area. Theology is another one. You know, there are popular preachers out there like uh, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, to mention a few. Have we checked their theology? Have we checked what they are teaching from the pulpit? You might be surprised at what you find. But what happens is when we get taken in by charisma, brilliance, leadership skills, these type of things, they are not discerned. They're not discerned or worse, they might be, caught, they might be covered up and not brought into accountability to the Lord. That's why we really have to be careful when we look at a person's natural gifts to fulfill a kingdom ministry. Got to make sure. You know, a common fallacy among Christians is that God saves us because he sees something in us that he can use. Stop. <laughs> stop, 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 stop. Don't know. We make the mistake of regarding someone according to the flesh and trying to bring that into the kingdom when we think that way. You know, we see somebody who's a great speaker. Man, if that person only spoke for Christ. 
it'd be, it'd be great. But the only thing, and I want to be real clear about this, the only thing that we bring to the table when it comes to God's salvation is the sin that made it necessary in the first place. That's it. God saved us not because he said, oh, I can use him. He said, no. He saved us because of his mercy, not because of righteousness, which we have done, righteous, uh, but according, not because of righteous works, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, saves us, it says in the New Testament, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost. You know, Paul reminds us in Romans seven eighteen that nothing good dwells in our flesh. And he's talking about himself when he wrote that. So the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary in the first place. God saves us because he has mercy on us and he makes us into new creations because he's got something new for us. So we've got to be exercise care when we regard one another. Now, on the negative side of the ledger, we look at one another's uh, natural characteristics, natural traits or gifts, and we might refuse to see them as fellow heirs in Christ. <laughs> I'm not dealing with that, brother. He's a pain. I'm not dealing with that, sister. Fill in the blanks. Now, we don't want to make the mistake, and we saw this in our gospel reading this morning, we don't want to make the mistake that the older brother of the prodigal son made who refused to join in the homecoming of his brother when he came home. He regarded his brother according to the flesh, but he did it negatively. He dealt with his brother according to his past sins. He would not deal with his brother as one who had been forgiven, but as one who had squandered his father's property on prostitutes, as he said. Could you imagine? If people are, you know, our, our family in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ, judged us according to what we did before we were saved, before we came to Christ, got to be careful of that. But we all come into the kingdom of God with baggage. Like I said before, you know, we're, you know, we're, God saves us and we're new creatures in Christ. But all these things we bring into the kingdom, God has to work out of us, right? That's a lifelong process. So we come into the kingdom of God with baggage. And Paul tells us in Romans 7 that, that as believers, there's an internal war that goes on with the sin that dwells in our members. We become aware of the struggle, right? We become aware of the things that we're struggling with, you know, whatever those things might be. We know of the struggle, and Paul lamented that struggle in his own life because he writes, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So this war will continue in our members until the Lord returns or takes us home. So we have to keep that in mind. And especially when we deal with each other and our flesh shows through. Those things come through. Somebody says a word against us. You know, we're in the heat of, the heat of anger. We say something against somebody else or we do something that's selfish, or somebody does something selfish to us, we got to keep those things in mind because God is still working in each and every one of us. So we've got to be patient with each other and loving with each other and forgiving with each other. So how do we avoid the mistake of regarding each other according to the flesh? Well, we need to adjust our perspective. Why? Well, Paul answers that. In verse 17 of uh, today's text from 2 Corinthians, he says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So in Christ, we are new creations. You know, we're going to carry some old behaviors with us, yes. And God will deal with those. But we've got to see ourselves. We have to see each other 
as God sees each and every one of us. We are new creations. We're already seated in the heavenly places with Christ. We're already there. So that's the perspective we need to adopt. You know, we don't do things, we don't do old things in a new way. Now that we're Christians, for God has called us to do new things. And as such, we have to stop viewing each other according to the flesh, that is, according to worldly standards, and learn how to view each other from the standpoint of God's salvation in Christ. Look around the room. What do you see? We see fellow heirs with Christ. That's what we have to remember. So where do we start to change our perspective? We start with Christ, as with all things. Paul once regarded Christ according to the flesh, right? He saw Christ as a criminal, and he witnessed him dying. Oh, well, I don't know if he witnessed it, but he saw Christ as a criminal who died a criminal death. But now he sees Christ revealed as the one who died for all and was raised for the sake of those who now live for him. So if we don't see Jesus as the one who died to make atonement for our sins, if we don't see Jesus as the one who was raised to life, that we might have new life, then that's where we need to start. If we still see Jesus as nothing more than a religious figure, or a good teacher, or a moral or holy man, if we see Jesus as anything less than the Christ, the Son of the living God who came to save us from our sins, then nothing is going to change. And actually, there's a much larger problem, because if, we don't, if we're not seeing Jesus that way, then we are not in Christ, and there's an eternal problem there. We'll have to talk about that. But if we indeed see Jesus as Savior and Lord, and have confessed him as such, then it's not only possible to change our perspective, but we are expected to pursue that perspective. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There is nothing for us here. Nothing. But when we see things from our heavenly seat, then our perspective can begin to change. We start to see Christ for who he is. We start to see ourselves for who we are. We start to see each other for who we are in Christ, new creations. So with a correct view of Christ, we can have a correct view of ourselves and of our brethren. And we can move to obey the scripture's command in Colossians 3 again, 12 through 14, which says this, Put on then as God's chosen ones, that's us, holy and beloved, that's us, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You know, when, teach, when, when Jesus taught us to pray, one of the lines in the prayer is, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass us. And we'll pray that together later as a congregation. So e each of these things, uh, love, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, you know, those can all be separate sermons in and of themselves. And we won't do that today. But I would encourage you to do a study in the scriptures of all the one another's, all the one another's uh, scriptures and references. Whether it's one another, bear with one another, forgive one another, or each other. Take your concordance. If you're in read a study group, you know what I'm talking about. Take your concordance or look for it online. Look for the phrase, each other or one another. And you'll get a list of instructions as to how we are to regard each other in Christ. So we'll wrap this up with a few questions and an answer. How do we regard one another? 
That's your homework. Let's take that home and let's do a little self-examination. How do we regard one another? Take the person in the body of Christ you think the most of and take the person in the body of Christ you might think the least of. And then ask yourself the question, how do I regard this brother or this sister? Do we see someone who is a natural fit for the kingdom? Do we look at others as Samuel did and think, surely this is the Lord's anointed? Or do we see someone who, in our esteemed judgment, sorry, insert sarcasm here, in our esteemed judgment is unfit for the kingdom, like the bitter brother of the prodigal son refusing to celebrate the repentance of a sinner? Remember what Jesus said, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner than re that repents than over a hundred sinners that come. In either case, we are regarding others according to the flesh when we do that. Whether we think highly or we think the opposite. We're regarding each other according to the flesh. And we are to do that no longer. No longer. Let us remember that everyone in Christ is a new creation. In need of teaching. In need of fellowship. In need of prayer. In need of the sacraments. Everyone in Christ is in need of encouragement and exhortation, patience and forbearance, forgiveness and love. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is the famous love chapter. You know, that was written to the church. Those are instructions for us. Paul didn't write that down and say, wow, this is going to be read at every wedding someday. Those are written for us. That's how we are to deal with each other. And as new creations, let us remember the new commandment given us by Christ, that we love one another just as he has loved us. Our credibility as a church depends on this because it is by this love for one another that all people will know that we are his disciples. Amen.